Good morning, and welcome to The People's Business, a production of the Fiscal Policy Institute and WRPI's Public Affairs Committee, and a part of WRPI's regular Tuesday morning feature, Capital District Progressive Radio. I'm Frank Morrow, Executive Director Emeritus of the Fiscal Policy Institute, and I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Brian McDonald, AFSCME New York's Legislative and Political Director, and Ron Deutsch, Executive Director of New Yorkers for Fiscal Fairness. And we're going to try our best to cast a little sunshine on the ways in which government is doing and not doing the people's business. Later in today's program, we'll be speaking with businessman, high-tech entrepreneur, innovative political thinker and activist Bill Samuels. But we hear, before we hear from Bill Samuels, we're pleased to be joined by past and likely future gubernatorial candidate Howie Hawkins of the Green Party. Howie, thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's good to be here. Thank you. This is Brian McDonald, and I'd also like to welcome our guest, Howie Hawkins, to the People's Business here on WRPI Troy. A resident of Syracuse since 1991, Howie's involved in numerous community development and energy efficient organizations, but he's best known for throughout the state of New York for his 2010 run for governor. Before we talk about some of the issues that you're involved with, Howie, can you tell us a little bit about how and when and why you got involved with the Green Party? Uh, I got involved in this kind of politics in the 60s as a teenager coming out of the civil rights movement. I'm in a racially mixed neighborhood, extended family, cousins were not racially mixed. And uh, so we were <clears throat> very aware of civil rights. And in 1964, um, the Mississippi Freedom Democrats were denied seating at the Democratic Convention. Ronald Reagan's campaigning against fair housing. They repealed the fair housing law in California. So I said, where's my party in 64, like John Lewis had said at the March on Washington. And by 67, we had a peace and freedom party Peace in Vietnam, freedom meant civil rights, and I've been involved in it ever since. Hmm. So wh when did the, the Green Party per se come into existence? Uh, we had our first national meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota in August 1984, and we're actually having our 30th anniversary convention there this summer in St. Paul. Hmm. Hey, this is Ron Deutsch, and I also want to welcome you uh, to our show today, The People's Business here on WRPI in Troy. So I wanted to ask you, Howie, I know that, uh, you know, a lot of other third parties uh, basically are endorsing other candidates in the Democratic or Republican Party, whether it's the Conservative Party or the Working Families Party. They tend not to run their own candidates. The Green Party definitely takes a different approach to this, uh, which I have to say I admire, and that, you know, you, you, you're always running your own candidates and you don't kind of do this cross-endorsement that so many others do. Um, why do you do that? Why not just do the simple cross endorsement and go for the, you know, the big vote get uh, that, that uh, many of the other groups do? Well, we're going for the big vote. We're going for as many votes as we can, but we believe that nobody can speak for working people like us. You know, the other parties try to get the major parties, which are mainly funded by the 1% of the 1%, the very, very rich people, the billionaires and hundreds of millionaires, and and then the people are out here trying to get them to say this or do that, and it doesn't work. Um, when they sign on another line or run on another line, that party will say, vote for them on our line, and I'll send a message to the major party candidate. I think the message is, take us for granted because we're going to vote for you anyway. We run our own people and then compete for those votes, and that forces the major parties either adopt some of the programs that we're promoting that are popular, or, you know, we'll get elected because you know, we're promoting those programs. So that's our approach, independent politics. Nobody can speak for us like us, you know, the regular working people. In, in local uh, elections, the uh, Green Party candidates occasionally, but rarely, have actually won. Uh, it's probably hard to win at a state level. So what, what, what do you try to accomplish in a state level campaign? You ran for governor in 2010, and you're likely to run for governor again. Uh, what what Given that your chances of winning are not great, you obviously are trying to impact the system in some other way as well. Well, the governor's race in New York State is the way you get a permanent ballot line. So uh, that's what we did in 2010. You need 50,000 votes. We got just short of 60,000. So our local candidates could then get on the ballot by getting the signatures of 5% of the Greens enrolled in the district in which they're running as opposed to an independent nominating petition, which we have to do without a ballot line, which is much more difficult. And later in the election cycle, the party petitions are in June and July. The independent petitions are in July and August. And then if they contest you, 
you may not get confirmed on a ballot till about October 1. So it's just much better. And because of that, we have a couple of village mayors in New Paltz and uh, Greenwich. We have uh, town board members, uh, a city council member in Ithaca. We do have local elected officials in New York and across the country we have about 200. So we want to build on that. So that's the mi minimal objective. In this election, we want to get enough votes so that if we get 5%, 250,000 votes, which we think is within our reach, we will have gotten more than any independent left uh, party in New York history. And then I think the media and the public will look to us when they want to know what the left is thinking on issues rather than a liberal Democrat or, you know, the second line for the Democrats, the Working Families Party. And I think that'll change the whole conversation, the dynamic of New York politics. So you, you say the Green Party is a party of the working man, um, and I think you you know you you ably uh, represent uh, working New Yorkers all across the state, struggling families. Um, are you independently wealthy that you can run for governor, or what is it that you do? I'm a teamster who unloads trucks at night at UPS. So you know there's this poll out there: unnamed working families candidate gets 24 percent. Well, I'm a working teamster with a name, Howie Hawkins. <laughs> I think that poll was about me. That's why I think, you know, this year particularly, uh, Cuomo has been very hard on the schools and on public services and with his budgets, and he's got a property tax proposal that really isn't a relief. Um, and that's got conservatives upstate as well as, you know, liberals and progressives and radicals around the state upset. So I think there's a real audience for what we're talking about. So, Howie, tell us a little bit about your platform. I see you're wearing a button today that says $15 an hour, so I assume the economic justice is a, is a part of your platform. Yeah, we're theme of our campaign is a Green New Deal for New York. And the New Deal part it goes back to Roosevelt, 1944. He does a State of the Union address, calls for a second economic bill of rights to provide people with some basic rights, like the right to a job, to a living wage. $15 an hour is even less than the 1963 March of Washington asked for. They asked for a $2 minimum wage which if you adjust for inflation is 1544 right now. Um, we believe in uh, health care for all through a publicly funded single payer plan. We want the schools fully funded. Uh, we want enough investment in housing and transit so it's affordable and convenient. And then the green part of the Green New Deal is we want to go for 100% clean energy by 2030. We want to ban fracking and go the renewable route and that in itself is a full employment program. We have this study out from Mark Jacobson. He led the, a consortium of scientists, engineers, and economists, a lot of them from New York, and they said it's technically and economically feasible to have 100% wind, solar, water, energy, uh, no carbon emissions by 2030. What's missing is the political will. But in that study, they said it would take 4.5 million jobs to build that system out over the next 15 years. Unemployment, 750,000 officially. You could double that if you count involuntarily. Uh, part-time employers and, of employees and also people that have not counted because they're discouraged and haven't looked in the last month. But that's still a lot more jobs than we have unemployed here. People will come to New York to help us build that system out. And then the question everybody says, well, how are you going to pay for it? And, you know, coming out of the 1963 march, which reiterated Roosevelt's demands, the March on Washington for jobs and freedom, put forward all these demands. And we've not made any progress since 70 years ago, Roosevelt, 51 years ago, the March on Washington. Coming out of that was a freedom budget that the organizers of the March on Washington. And our freedom budget basically says, let's go back to the 1970s tax structure we had in New York. It was more progressive on business and personal income taxes. Uh, we didn't have all this corporate welfare, and we kept instead of rebated the stock transfer tax. And, you know, we figured there's at least $30 billion more in revenue there. And most of us working people would get a tax cut. And the, the difference would be made up by the top 5%, and particularly the top 1%. And that's well, how we can fund a Green New Deal for New York. This is the uh, People's Business on WRPI Troy, and we're speaking with past and likely future gubernatorial candidate Howie Hawkins of the Green Party. His website is www.howiehawkins, all one word, dot org. So, Howie, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, you, you've been rather critical of <laughs> Governor Cuomo. Uh, the governor is, you know, trying to paint himself a, as more progressive, perhaps, than you would suggest he is. Um, there was a lot of debate around tax policy in this year's budget, uh, in particular things like the elimination of the dedicated bank tax, uh, eliminating uh, or increasing the thresholds on the state's uh, estate tax, 
uh, and this property tax freeze, all of which you seem to disagree with. I uh, read some of your press releases that you put out. Uh, so what do you think? Is the governor as progressive as he claims? Is he a social progressive uh, or is he an economic progressive? What, what's your thoughts on that? I think he's very conservative on his economic policies and he's playing uh, games with people. He says I'm providing property tax relief and he's touting tax cuts, but most of those tax cuts are the ones you mentioned, the bank tax cuts, the corporate rates, the zero rates for manufacturers cuts in the estate taxes, he's still rebating 100% of the stock transfer tax. That's all for the 1%, the rich folks. Um, what we get for ordinary people upstate in particular that are really under a heavy burden of property taxes because the state does not share the revenues like they used to. Revenue sharing is a way to uh, share some of the state revenues that we are paying to the state back to the municipalities and the schools and let us locally decide how much of that to devote to property tax relief or restoring school uh, and municipal services. And he doesn't provide revenue sharing. He's kept it at a flat rate. Um, it's less than 1% of state revenues. The original uh, revenue sharing law that was in the state finance law was 8% of state revenues. You know, everybody who lives in communities, just imagine your city or county or village or town budget if you had eight times the revenue sharing you're getting now. You would end all the fiscal distress we've got all over upstate. So, you know, that's, he's imposing austerity on working people so he can give those tax cuts to the rich folks. And we're going to pay for it in cuts to our schools and property taxes. Um, I was in Ithaca last week, and they are getting a big $7.31 on average in Tompkins County uh, tax rebate check. The Ithaca School District is raising taxes, property taxes, 8%, and they're still going to have to lay off people and cut programs. That's, that's what... Governor Cuomo has been giving us. Uh, our, our guest, Howie Hawkins, uh, lives in Syracuse, so the <coughs> comments on revenue sharing are uh, pretty important to his, uh, his, his home base. Uh, I, I, I know you're a native of California. How did you select Syracuse as a place to uh, settle in? Well, I have been working construction, and it was 89, and there was a depression in construction, so I'm logging, and a tree almost rolled on me. I had to rush it, and a disc in my back, so I had to get a desk job. And uh, I got a job organizing cooperatives in Syracuse, um, which enabled my back to heal. And then the funding ran out for that, so I went out to UPS and got the job on loading trucks. What, what do you see as the economic future for Syracuse? It's pretty dismal if we don't get revenue sharing back up. Um, the mayor asked for $16 million for emergency repairs to infrastructure. On my block, we've had the gas main break the same week that uh, they had an explosion in East Harlem. We've had the sewer back up into the building. We've had water main break, which we had two a day all winter, um, and the potholes are so big the kids can get lost in them. I mean, it's really falling apart up there. Um, we've had a quarter of the staffing for our schools laid off in the last four years, and uh, we're getting no relief from the governor. And our mayor, who was pretty much philosophically in agreement with Cuomo, called him out in the New York Times for not taking leadership. She wanted amendments to the labor laws so she could go after workers, public workers, employee um, health care and, and pension benefits. And she just said, Cuomo, you, I'm out here on a limb by myself, you got to lead. And he didn't like the fact that he was called out, so he just cut Syracuse off. And that seemed petty. And it's, uh, you know, there's the Buffalo Billion, and Rochester got a little extra this year. We got nothing. Um, and it just seems vindictive. You're in Albany today uh, for a, a number of events. You uh, participated in some of the Earth Day events yesterday. Uh, Earth Day itself nationally was back in April, but New York State yesterday had a big uh, uh, Earth Day lo lobby day, and today is a big single-payer lobby day. Uh, t tell us about the single-payer uh, issue in New York and what you uh, uh, guys at the lobby day are pushing for. Well... Single-payer health care, the state did a study at the request of the legislature back in 2009 and said by 2018 we would save, as New Yorkers, $28 billion a year on our health costs and cover everybody over this individual mandate system that we've got with the Affordable Care Act and the federal government. So single-payer would make a lot of sense. It would relieve municipal budgets because that would be taken off their budgets and funded through the state system. What we want to do this year is get the assembly to vote for the bill. There 
there are 74 uh, sponsors, I believe, at this point. That's one short of a majority. Is the bill a study of single payer no, or something is, more? this is a bill for single payer. This is the Gottfried bill? The Gottfried bill. So we will be, you know, getting briefed this morning on that, and then we're going to go lobby the uh, legislators and, you know, push uh, Speaker Silver to let's have a vote. And, you know, sometimes people sponsor bills, but when it comes time to vote, they don't really want to. We see this in California when Governor Schwarzenegger was the governor. The Democratic uh, legislature would pass single payer and then he'd veto it. Now they've got a Democratic governor majority and they don't vote on it. You know, so we want people to get off the fence and get on the record. Howie, there's a history of minor parties in New York State, but most of the people you're going to be talking to generally are members of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. So you've got an uphill battle to get your message out. So tell us a little bit about your campaign plan. Where are you going? Who are you talking to? And what kind of reception are you getting? Well, I'm talking to everybody. I am meeting sometimes with, sometimes on the QT, with Democratic clubs in the city, um, with organizations that traditionally support Democrats. There are members of the Democratic Party calling us. I have, you know, been active in this kind of politics for a long time. I've never seen a response like this. I think it's partly, you know, anger at Cuomo for being, you know, uh, very conservative on the economic issues in particular. In particular, I think uh, the Obama hope and change that, you know, Hope has uh, worn off, and people are wondering, you know, where are we at now? And, and so they're beginning to look at their options. Um, I think the public employees and the teachers are really angry at the way they've been treated. Parents are upset with this high-stakes testing regime that's been imposed. So um, we're having trouble keeping up with the inquiries, how can we help and whatnot. So um, what we're doing is uh, raising money. We hope to open four field offices and have an organizer in each one, New York City, Albany, Syracuse, and Western New York. And it'll either be Rochester or Buffalo. And uh, maybe even some more. When I, was, when I was in Ithaca, somebody offered free space. Um, and they, maybe we'll just have a volunteer operation out of there. So, um, you know, this is, this is the biggest uh, campaign we've ever had. And, and, you know, our challenge is to just keep up and be able to scale up to what's coming at us. I, I was going to ask you, I, mean, I got a, kind of a two-part question. One would be um, any thoughts on who your lieutenant governor uh, would be and then uh, to follow up with that, um, what would what would the first day of the Howie Hawkins uh, gubernatorial uh, <coughs> beginnings look like? Uh, we will have an announcement uh, either later this week or early next week of a candidate that uh, I've talked to who um, I think will be, you know, a powerful addition to the ticket. And that's all I can say at this point because we got to let the Greens hear it from us first rather right. than through the media. Because you have a convention coming up. Say a little about your convention. Yeah, May 17th in Troy, New York at the Sanctuary for Independent Media. We'll start at 9 in the morning and go till 6 and we will have, uh, you know, a... Uh, nominating session, uh, a platform mm -hmm. session, workshops to train people how to uh, organize locally, how to use our computerized platform for keeping all the information about our supporters and funders and whatnot. And then uh, we'll have a rally after we've nominated and, and, and wrap it up by 6 or 6.30. Um, how are delegates to your convention selected? Uh, they are representatives of county organizations. They are elected by their county membership. and. Uh, we have to, by state law, do a weighted vote based on the gubernatorial vote for the nominations. For the platform, any enrolled Green in the state can come and vote on the platform. So um, that's that's the plan for the convention. Well, let's go back to Ron's uh, question. I, I, I don't know if you're thinking this uh, far ahead, but uh, do you have plans for what you would do at the beginning of your administration? Yeah, I was asked that when I announced. And, uh, First, I said I get I call Ralph Nader and Gar Alper and some people like that and say get your Rolodex out. I got a staff <laughs> and administration. Uh, then I thought you know what I would do is convene the minimum wage board that the governor has the power to do. He's been asked by the legislature to do so for tipped workers. He has not. The law says he should. Um, and and get people on there and, and let's look at the minimum wage. I think it's fifteen dollars statewide, and then there should be a home rule for communities like New York City where the cost of living is very high, where it should be higher. I think the other thing I do is form this Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission that uh, Dr. Alice Green with the Center for Law and Justice in Albany has been calling for to look at the impact of the war on drugs on the communities especially impacted, let them testify, and then figure out a way to repair the damages. 
and that was one of the things I was doing yesterday as well. We had a demonstration against the uh, uh, solitary confinement, but a lot of these criminal justice issues where we have a real disparity in the treatment of different communities that have to be addressed. So that would be another thing I would do on day one. Form that commission. It's modeled after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission they did in South Africa that Mandela initiated to, you know, get past the apartheid era. So uh, uh, let's have a last question uh, from Ron Deutsch. Okay, one of my favorites, mm -hmm. and we've talked about this on the show before, and we've actually had Assemblyman Phil Steck on recently who uh, has been pushing a bill on this. You bring up the stock transfer tax a lot. Uh, it's one of those... Uh, kind of hidden uh, items uh, that we don't really talk about in New York State. It's a tax that's still on the books, uh, even though the legislature tried to remove it uh, this past session. We were able to, to keep it well, on the books. Well, the governor proposed right, it. The governor proposed it. The Senate uh, accepted it. The Assembly rejected it. And in the final budget, uh, it still remains. So um, tell us a little bit about the stock transfer tax and why you'd like to see it reimposed. Well, it's a tax of pennies per share per trade uh, that, you know, traders used to pay. The tax was instituted in 1906, and they paid up until 1981. It's been 100% rebated. They actually pay it now, and it gets rebated right back to them. And it's generated between 12 and $16 billion in recent years because mm -hmm. of this computerized high-frequency trading where these big firms jump in the front of the line and kind of skim some money off ahead of us retail investors or you know even if we don't have personal investments we might have a pension fund that you know my teamsters pension fund that you know we're, we're basically paying for that uh, I call it computerized insider trading so the least they can do is uh, pay a tax we pay seven eight nine percent sales tax on most things we buy but you know the wealthy are you know doing all these trades and and they're not paying anything so um, it would be a good source of revenue for the state. And, I'm, you know, I appreciate the fact that Assemblyman Steck has put the bill in to keep some of that revenue. And uh, we were nervous because, you know, Governor Cuomo called it a nuisance tax. He just wanted to get rid of it, another <laughs> favor to the 1%. And one of the small victories we had is it's still there on the books, so we can maybe uh, keep that tax. This is The People's Business on WRPI Troy, and we've had the pleasure of speaking with past and likely future gubernatorial candidate Howie Hawkins of the Green Party. You can see uh, information about Howie and his uh, issues uh, at www.howiehawkins.org. Howie, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us this morning. Well, thanks for having me. We'll be back in a uh, few minutes.